It will be another big day for Rishi Sunak as MPs vote on his updated Rwanda bill. So far, members of his own party have branded the bill partial and incomplete. He's about to host a breakfast meeting in an attempt at Downing Street to win round rebels. Jonathan Gullis, one of those right-wingers, will be here after nine o'clock to tell us what happened in that meeting. But with us now, Talk TV's political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald, and former Home Office Minister in a very boring jacket today, Norman Baker. <laughs> Gang, welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Alicia, we talked about this last hour. For many people, they'll go, oh, God, oh, God, what's happening? Uh, I think, seminal moment for Sunak today... Definitely. I mean, this week is arguably the biggest moment of his premiership so far. Yesterday, he was at the COVID inquiry, and today he faces that big vote on his amended Rwanda bill. This will decide whether or not this new version of the bill can bypass certain areas that the Supreme Court deemed illegal. The party is so divided on this at the moment. So many people think it's partial, it's incomplete. That is what the ERG, the European Research Group, have said. And then there are people more towards the centre who think that the wise move is to pass this bill now and maybe add amendments later. So today's vote is going to be a big one. Norman? It's a disaster, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it, it really is. I mean, you couldn't invent this. If you wanted to create something which was a, a complete shambles, this is it. I mean, he's made this a huge issue, the Rwanda bill, uh, and the small boats. He's highlighted it. He's brought it out of proportion, not saying it's not important, but he's given it uh, a real bit of welly. And the consequence is that uh, he's now got in, in the spotlight, uh, this bill. He's got a divided party. One half won't tolerate it as it is not strong enough. The other half won't tolerate it if it goes any further because it's going to break international law. And irony of ironies, Rwanda, which is an unsafe country, apparently, according to the Supreme Court, won't wear it if international law is broken. So we're depending on Rwanda to determine what international law is. Norman, you were a, you were a Home Office Minister many, many moons ago. Um, help me out. Uh, nobody can answer this question. Why would you, and, and Nicholas said it, uh, look like you're going to die on the hill of a policy that even your most fervent supporters will repeatedly say is at current rates 200 plus million quid at most, we might get 500 people there. Yes. It does absolutely zilch to deal with 170,000-plus backlog. And we don't need to sit and get into a debate. It's legal, it's illegal. He's made his decision. But why the hell... You were a politician. Explain this to me. Why would you not, in this position, come out, stand in front of the British people and say, do you know what? This is what I'm going to say to you. The Home Office isn't fit for purpose. I might have 12 months left. I'm going to abandon this joke of a policy. You can accuse me of flip-flopping. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start tackling the backlog because it's embarrassing for this country and we are stuck like we were over Brexit, as Nick said earlier. Why won't a politician do that? Well, Norman? he should do that because I think if he comes out and actually takes a firm position and shows some leadership, he might actually get some kudos from I it. do as well. He would upset some people in his own party, but he would get some kudos. At the moment, he can't stop the boats, he can't start the planes. It's a completely hopeless position. But the other thing to bear in mind is that the number of people coming on boats is a fraction of those who are coming in legally. Mm. The migration figures, net migration, three and quarter, quarter of a million, I think it was, last year. 1.2 million actually came in and some, some left. That's a huge number compared to the small, small number coming on boats. But you will still understand why it is central and why it is such a big thing and why people want an answer. And I just feel like the guy's got himself in knots, don't you, Alicia? Well, this is it. So migration is seen as something that is really important amongst the electorate. Lots of polls suggest that so many people in the UK want migration figures to be reduced. Those numbers don't translate to the Rwanda policy, though. There are lots of people who, whilst they agree that illegal migration is wrong and they really want to reduce those numbers, they don't think the Rwanda policy is the right way to go about it. So the issue here that Sunak has is he's chosen this policy. He doesn't have another plan on how to make these numbers go down. So he kind of has to just follow it through and try and make it work. Exactly, because people's argument is always, well, you know, it's, we've spent six, on, oh, well, six to eight million a day on hotels. We will still have to do that, even if the Rwanda policy yes. works. We'll still have to go through the backlog. And also, there will still be opportunities for people who are taken to Rwanda to end up back in this country under certain rules. It's just not going to work. Plus, we're going to end up having to pay for people for the first five years. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. And the other issue that the Public Accounts Committee brought to light recently is that the amount of money that's already been given to Rwanda for this scheme may not even be returned to us if it isn't successful. <laughs> so Rwanda will just be walking away with a really big chunk of cash and nothing to show for it. So the public are obviously going to be I, asking a lot of questions about where their money is, is being spent. Norman, I thought uh, yesterday was, was, was interesting. I think, um, I mean, we saw him at the COVID inquiry. Yes. being grilled about, you know, eat out to freak out and everything else. 
he was the only person at the COVID inquiry, which perhaps tells you something about his mindset, who defended Boris Johnson's tenure at number 10 and said, I sort of thought it was all right. That, to me, is absolutely nothing to do with his opinion. That is, I'm being fought by the ER, uh, ERG, I'm being fought yes. by the One Nations, I've had to bring Cameron back. The last thing I want is all the Boris acolytes to jump up and down. I is he? And I'm not, I'm not trying to build this up. Is he a dead man walking in your mind? I think he is. And the Rwanda bill will probably go through today, by the way, I think. Yeah. Um, With but... a promise for amendments, which means it will never well, reach it, what it is. The amendments won't happen because the amendments are pushed by the, by the right of the Tory party. The left of the Tory party will vote them down, along with the Labour Party and Lib Dems and everybody else. If a miracle of miracles gets through the Commons, the Lords won't wear it. And actually, the best thing you can do for Richard Sunak today is kill the bill, because that would give him less pain in the longer term. Do you think he'll do that? Well, you've got the sense he would actually pull it because it isn't going to go anywhere in the long term. He's going to string it out for months mm -hmm. and it won't happen. And I predict here that we'll have no planes taking off between now and the election. And Alicia, if the bill didn't go through today, what would the consequences be of that? Well, it will be catastrophic for Rishi Sunak's leadership, that's for sure. I mean, all of the Conservative MPs that I've spoken to are saying that they feel super uneasy about this. And this would be the first bill that has failed so early on in its process since 1986. So it's really... Rare. And do we know that... We found this out yesterday. Do you know what that bill was? The shop's bill. It was about yeah, shops. Sunday, Sunday trading. Sunday, 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 Sunday trading. trading. You're old, Norman. You're as old as me, man. You remember it. Um, it, it, it feels like a massive day. And then, of course, the other thing is waking up, so if you're waking up this morning, today, and it doesn't seem like four years, today was the day that Johnson, four years ago, won yes. his 80-seat majority. God, Norman Baker, how much has <laughs> happened in the last four years? Well, mostly, mostly catastrophe and chaos. Yep. And four years is a long time in politics, as Harold Wilson didn't say but might have said. <laughs> I mean, look, to be honest with you, I, mean, I would say this, wouldn't I, but since the coalition ended, it's been one disaster after another in government terms. The coalition was a, was a form of government was actually quite stable. People look back with, with warmth towards that now. Yeah, but I can start criticising the coalition. Come on, there's many people that would look at the Liberal Democrats and say that you traded some of the things that you believed in, of like course university we did. fees, to, the to get into that. I'm not sticking up for the Tories. Yeah. Some people will say that coalition works. I just look at the whole thing, Norman, and I think my, it's, it's almost like we're going through the last throes. That's yeah. how it feels. I'll tell you what we've got now from Rishi Sunak. It's political incompetence. Yeah. Leaving aside the rights and wrongs yeah. of, the, of, the, of the policy, the way he's handled it, the position he's got himself into Has he been today, found out, do you think? Has he been found out? Yeah. I think he has. I, you know, he's, he's a bureaucrat. He's not a prime minister. Interesting. Alicia? Has he been found out? Yeah. Mm, I think lots of people didn't have faith in Rishi Sunak because lots of people still really, really back Boris Johnson, for example, in the party. They say he's the last prime minister with an actual mandate and who actually got the public's vote. So he's, he's had a bit of a tough time since he began his premiership. I don't think this has been a massive change and I think people probably saw this coming. Can we talk really briefly about WhatsApp's uh, and the COVID inquiry <laughs> yesterday. There weren't a lot of headlines generated from Rishi's performance. I think that's probably intentional. What he wanted. In, yeah, exactly. Yeah, nice what he wanted. However, um, he said that he'd changed phones a few times since then, despite the fact that he was uh, told to look after his uh, and store his WhatsApp messages at one point because the, we knew that this was going to happen. He says those WhatsApps don't exist. So why earlier in the year did he file a motion, or I can't remember if it was a motion or not, but he tried his best to stop the inquiry from accessing his WhatsApps mm. if they don't exist? Well, this is a really important question and one that probably no one actually has the exact answer to. <laughs> I think yesterday people really were suspicious of Rishi Sunak's claim that all the WhatsApps just didn't exist and he couldn't access them anymore. It's the same do, as... Do, do you know what I think? It's a great question from Nick Wright. I, we were talking about this earlier. I can sort of understand the buffoon that Johnson is, like me, wouldn't know how to work a phone. But we're told that this man is high-tech, multi-talented, will end up in Silicon Valley, and he doesn't know about WhatsApp. I don't buy that at all. Well, yesterday. the other, the other important all. factor in this is that recently there was that whole story about the prank call that happened to Rishi Sunak's phone, and allegedly that was the number of the phone that he was using whilst he was Chancellor in the pandemic, which he said was no longer in use, didn't work anymore, yet it <laughs> rang and it went to voicemail. So that has definitely put this whole situation into question about whether or not he is being truthful about this. It's fascinating. Fascinating, isn't it? It's but... extraordinary. All these WhatsApp messages going missing from Richard Sunak and from Boris Johnson. Um, everybody else seems to manage to keep theirs, but they've lost theirs somehow. And selective amnesia, couldn't remember this. Barely in number 10. Was number 10 having parties? I don't know. I wasn't there. Hmm. I mean, it really did... Uh, well, we might as well ask the question. The three of you just blow me out of the water with it. But um, uh, rumours yesterday, whether they're true or not, that a dream ticket 
of Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage could sail into Downing Street or wherever it is on a boat together. He's out the jungle. He's out. Well, is he getting a haircut? I should know. Um, is this is this being talked about? Uh, it is being talked about. Whether or not it's realistic is a different question. Neither Nigel Farage nor Boris Johnson are sitting MPs at the moment. So to go from not being members of Parliament to being That's easy, the Prime Minister. Come on, jobs for yeah. the boys. Well, I mean, David Cameron's man yeah. pretty close yeah. to that recently. Well, so may, maybe. Norman? It's... Bit of a nightmare <laughs> ticket for me. But I have to say, what's happening with the Tory party now, in my view, genuinely, is they've written off the election. They think they're going to lose. And they're now scrabbling around for the position the party will take after the next election, which could involve a new leader, of course, if Richie loses. And Starmer mm. is going to be making a speech later on today. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what is expected to be in that speech? Absolutely. So today marks the four-year anniversary from the 2019 election. That was when Boris Johnson defeated Jeremy Corbyn in a landslide victory. Keir Starmer is expected today to talk about how he's changed the Labour Party, how he's really abandoned that Jeremy Corbyn ethos that he was really keen to get rid of in his time as leader. He's also going to be talking about why the Labour Party are the only party fit to govern the UK and definitely capitalising a bit on that Tory civil war that we're seeing um, within Rishi Sunak's government. At the Psychodrama, I think, is going to be the word of the year next year. Yeah, I think that's something that everyone is fed up of so, hearing when it comes so to... So you've politics. only been here a couple of days and you're going to Milton Keynes, you lucky <laughs> person. Norman, um... I think anybody uh, of any political persuasion would admit that Starmer has done a very good job with the Labour Party and dragged it uh, past and away from what happened with Corbyn. The problem Except is... Except probably people who are more on the left who would argue that he's yeah. become a Tory. Yeah, well, they there you go. That's and, the thing. And... But my, my, my question would be, um, is there going to come a point... Let's take Rwanda. I think we all agree it's not great. Are we going to, or are the electorate going to expect more detail from Starmer in the next few months? Yes, they are. Just to pick up on that last point, I mean, he was praising Margaret Thatcher last week, which yeah. I think was, a, was uh, anathema to many in his own party. Um, but yes, I mean, his speech today, I predict, will be full of um, generalisations, criticism of the Tories, um, me measures about how he's changed the party without really saying what he believes in in terms of policy. Mm. And he won't be able to get through between now and the election without giving out some policy details. I know why he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want, doesn't want to do it because the Tories will latch on to policies and criticise them, so he's keeping quiet. But you know, at some point, the electorate wants to know what he stands for. Is he a shoe in Well, at the moment he is, I think, to be honest with you. Either that or a hung parliament. Certainly the people don't want to vote Conservative at the moment. But the danger is if the Tories somehow manage to recover their ground then what's he got to offer? Nobody knows what he stands for. Mm. It's, it's really interesting, interesting, isn't it? Because there's mm. ultimately there's, I should imagine, a large body of people in the UK who are not happy with Starmer and the direction that he's taken, but ultimately would never vote Conservative. And so they're kind of begr will, will be going to the polls quite begrudgingly um, rather than with passion. I think the way things are at the moment, genuinely, is that people have decided not to vote Conservative in large numbers and they will vote for whoever can defeat them in any is, particular is, seat. Is that not the battleground? Nick makes the point about there will be left-wing members of the Labour Party who won't like the direction but of Starmer, but will do it. There will be members of the Tory party who will say, this isn't the Tory party anymore, but we couldn't bring ourselves to vote for anybody else. It's the middle ground, isn't it, Norman? That's what your party's going to be fighting on. That's it, what everybody's fighting, the red yes. wall, that middle ground, right? Yeah, well, I mean, the, elect the electorate is in the middle. It mm. always has been. I mean, I think it's margin left of centre, others will argue it's margin right of centre, but it's in the middle. And if you go to extremes, either right or left, you lose votes. Very interesting. Guys, listen, thank you. Alicia, thank day you. two, off to Milton Keynes. Day one. <laughs> so, day one! Day one. Oh, I yeah. saw him at telly yesterday, don't start. But good, <laughs> good luck with the roundabouts. Norman, as ever, thank you very much indeed.